Yeah, let's get going with it, if you don't mind, Logan. Uh, yeah, let's go. Yeah, so, just touching back, so you say your dad played hockey at BU? Yeah, my dad played hockey at BU. He played on. He played for MIT, too. Like, my dad's a really smart dude. He's an aerospace engineer. Wow. And so, uh, when he moved to California, like, he was, he was getting up at, like, 4 a.m., you know, for, like, those weird ice times and stuff, yep. trying to, like, play in a men's league and... Um, he, he always jokes with me, like, he wishes I would have played hockey, you know what I mean, growing up. And, uh, and like, you know, I played soccer. I played pretty much all the sports growing up, but he was like, you know, hockey wasn't that big in California. So uh, my brother got into a little bit of roller hockey, like, in high school. But, he like, he he was really into that, but he was always kind of disappointed that we never – I don't know because he was very uh, pa- he's very passionate about hockey about playing hockey he doesn't watch it so much anymore but he, he loves the game. But did you dabble with it at all? Did you ever get out there playing on the ice or <laughs> hockey anything like that? Yeah, yeah, I played a little roller hockey with my brother. You know, get out with uh, the sticks and the cul-de-sac and yep. and mess around with that. And then like I always felt like uh, to be quite honest, like skating came really naturally to me. Like I don't skate very often or very regularly. And every time I get on the ice, I always feel very comfortable. Like and I've never had any kind of formal training with it. So I'm sure it kind of like is in my blood, you know, to like use that stereotype a little bit. But, um, you know, I've always wondered like if I had pursued that, like what it would have been. And because, you know, I think – you know, I'm about 6'4", I'm about 265 right now. So I'm probably a little heavier than I would be naturally. But, I, you know, that's a big hockey player. So, oh, yeah. Um, 265? I've lost about 10 pounds, 15 pounds Holy since uh, last year. Yeah, so. Jeez, uh, so you played, your playing weight was 275. 275, the, the latter half of my career. So, like, um, basically, like, I had a conversation in, like, 2015. They said, like, you are not going to catch any more passes. Like, you need to get really good at blocking. And I was a pretty good blocker, <laughs> you know, but like when they say basically you're not going to, you know, catch any balls anymore, you're like, oh, I'm basically like an offensive lineman. So like that extra 10, 15 pounds is like very helpful in terms of like, you know, putting your face on somebody and like for pass protection and stuff like that, it really helps out. Um, so yeah, I kind of made that decision and, you know, I, 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 sometimes I think back on it, like, was it the right move? Um, you know, because I never really sat with the team after that time period, but I did play 10 years, so I guess I can't be too upset about it. Right. Well, I think the average in the NFL is, what, three? Maybe. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like three and a half or something. And, uh, you know, yeah, like, I, you know, I was an undrafted free agent coming out of UCLA, and I never thought I was going to play in the NFL. Like, I remember – you know, being in training camp and kind of thinking about what I wanted to do after training camp was over. I was like, oh, this is really cool. You know, I got a taste of what the show looks like or whatever. Uh, but, you know, maybe I need to think about going to law school or doing whatever I'm going to do uh, to kind of like once once I wake up from like this dream, you know, and then I ended up making the team and I was like, well, I'm going to get cut next year. And then <laughs> I played three years. Like, I, you know, my first year, I think a lot of people, I tell a lot of people this, I stayed in like an extended stay hotel. Um, over in uh, Sterling because I thought that I was going to be cut like every single day and I didn't want like a lease, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I, uh, so I, I, I played for three years and I was like, well, I won't play this deal out. And then I played that deal out. And then, you know, I went to Chicago and San Fran, Atlanta and Houston, but like, you know, it just kind of every year I was like, well, this is, I'm going to get cut and it's going to be really hard. And, but you know, like here I am and I it, like worked out. So so let's uh let's go back to that first training camp for a second you said you came out of ucla undrafted free agent so going into that camp obviously like you said i'm sorry that uh you were making plans for afterwards so kind of being that guy that might not have been the highly touted prospect high on the depth chart were you kind of starstruck going in there like holy crap uh, you know here's so and so and like who were some of those players and were you able to learn from their professionalism and how to how to work to prolong your career so yeah you know I was actually kind of a a Redskins fan I really liked the style of offense that they played you know like I I've always enjoyed people who run the football well and like Stephen Davis was out here for a while and like the you know Clinton Cordes and and so like when I got to meet some of those guys that was really kind of spectacular but I remember like the first time because like when when I was a rookie they did a little different like you'd come in independently of the vets and then you have like a week like a weekend of like rookie mini camp and then you'd come back and then the whole team would be there and I remember the first time walking in I just was like blown away 
by how absolutely huge everyone was. Like Donovan McNabb's a quarterback, and I think he was like 260. You know what I mean? He's like 6'3", and just a huge man. He was inclined bench pressing like 275 for reps of five, <laughs> sets of five. And you're like, oh, my God, like, I can't even do that on a flat bench. You know what I mean? So, like, it was just, like, a different breed of human. Like, I tell people it's, like, the ultimate natural selection. You get so many people playing football, like, youth football, and then the best just kind of keep going, keep going, keep going. And by the by, by the time you get to the top, like, you just see, like, the – the outer echelon of what a human being can look like and what a human being can do, which is pretty spectacular. And then in terms of professionalism, like the second part of your question, like I learned all that from my dad, to be totally honest. Like my dad, um, he, you know, was an aerospace engineer. He worked the same job for 43 years. He never missed a day, never was late. And so when I left, he was like, Logan, like, you know, this isn't college anymore. Like this is a job. So treat it like a job. And that was like, my example of what what it meant to have a job same with my mom my mom worked the same job for I want to say like 35 years you know human resources and never missed a day like same type of thing so that was like what I understood it to be like get there early stay late do everything that's asked of you be on time and that's what I did and I think um I didn't know it at the time but in retrospect that really served me well Right. And I think that's a pretty key point that you just hit on to show up, be on time, put the work in, stay late if you need to. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, I think that, that a lot of that kind of gets lost nowadays. But um, also to what you were saying that you learned that from your father, we do have a lot of hockey parents that listen to this. So yeah. um, I think that's an important note for, for some of our listeners to take away that, you know, the first real hero in your kid's life is going to be your father. Uh, so, uh, the kids are going to want to mimic everything that you do. And by setting that great example on what work ethic is and those, those things that don't require any talent or skill, like showing up, uh, on time, working hard, staying late, doing all the things you should to develop those right. successful habits. I think that's awesome that you had such a positive male influence in your life to, to show you that. Uh, and then hopefully that, you know, any parents listening are doing the same mimicking those habits to, to teach their kids as well. Yeah. And like, I do a lot of like, uh, especially the later, like the latter half of my career, I was doing a lot of like mentorship. And so I do a lot of talks with the rookies and stuff. And one of the things that's so incredibly critical, like in my opinion, at any level of sport, you know, and then any level of profession and just interacting with people is like your attitude, like you were talking about and your effort. And I know that sounds so cliche, but like it really, those are the two variables, especially in like a crazy industry like the NFL that you can control. And like I used to tell the guys, like, don't give them a reason to cut you by having like a bad attitude or not giving anything less than a hundred percent. Like um, if, you, if, 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 if you do really uh, well with those two categories, like the coaches understand that it's important to you. And that's really important because the coach is going to invest more time in you and they're going to help you out a little bit more. So I, I really can't like stress that point enough, you know, how important those two factors are in, uh, in athletic and just like success in life, you know? Absolutely. Hey, going back to um, sort of your progression, right. In your career, you were saying um, you played your first, what, three seasons with the Skins, right? I played my first six season with the Skins. Okay. Uh, I, I, so I played out my rookie deal because it was a three-year deal because I was crazy. undrafted. So I played the three years, signed a new deal, played, the, played that deal out, which was great. Like, you know, exceeded all expectations. Like, um, yeah, man, it was, it was a pretty spectacular uh, experience, you know, to do that and play, stay in the same place for a long time. And then kind of right around that time, you know, my son was born, we bought a house here and I was like, man, I'm going to stay. It's going to be great. And then kind of the best laid plans. <laughs> you, get shipped, you, know, you get shipped off. Yeah, you yeah, probably got out of that extended stay hotel. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, and then I lived in an extended stay when I was in Chicago and then I went to San Fran and got cut three times and re-signed in the same year. I lived in a Airbnb that was like, that 15 people lived in. I could touch the walls with my arms. It was just a mattress on the floor pretty much. And, <laughs> nice. You know, like everyone thinks of like the NFL is like this crazy glamorous thing, but it is, it can be pretty stressful, you know? So sure and, and as, you, as you guys know, with the hockey stuff too. So what made it, um, when you were talking earlier, you, you sounded like you were surprised almost to, to make it, I think after your first, after your first rookie deal was, was done, right? The first three years coming yeah. back, what were some of the factors that, that kind of surprised you or why did, why did you think that way 
instead of, you know, is it like a confidence thing or? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I was surprised every year. And I think just knowing how hard it was to be in the NFL, like, I, you know, I was the last man signed to the 53 man roster my rookie year. So like literally they cut a guy and signed me after cuts, you know what I mean? So I wouldn't be on practice squad. So I was like, literally, I'm like the last person on the roster. And, um, now did they tell you that or you knew that because of, well, I knew that cause I knew the guy that they cut and then okay. like, you know what I mean? Like you just kind of bring around to Rosie, like, 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 uh, the, uh, like Bruce Allen called me and was like, I was out to get lunch with another practice squad guy. He's like, Oh, we're going to sign you the 53. And I was so, um, unaware that I thought it was a joke by like another guy on the team, you know? So I called my agent. I was like, I got a call from a guy. He said he's Bruce Allen. Like, can you just like check it out? And then it was like, yeah, you're on the team. And I was like, wow, that's great. You know? And then, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, I, and I think, and I think that really informed like my entire career. You know what I mean? That experience of like being on the fringe and knowing you're on the fringe, like it just made me push, like that much harder you know what I mean like and I and I wasn't like the best athlete like I'm a pretty good athlete by like you know normal population standards but when you're in the NFL like I was very very average probably below average so I knew I had to kind of uh turn over every stone and look for every opportunity to um kind of better myself and get myself on the field if that makes sense yeah and was that kind of your mentality throughout your whole football career, going back to like youth football, into high school, college, every step of the way? Or was it at those lower levels, you excelled pretty quickly, so you didn't necessarily have to put in that same kind of work that you did once you got to the professional level? So that's an interesting question. I didn't play like youth football. I, I started playing in high school, but I played uh, really competitive uh, travel soccer when I was in uh, – like middle school uh, and then high school for a little bit too. And that team was like so competitive. Like all those guys thought they were going D1. And I was like the first rotational guy in, maybe the second rotational guy in. And in soccer, you only get a certain number of subs. So like you really have to show that you are like worth the substitution kind of thing. Right. And, um, and uh, that I think really – kind of informed that you know like I wasn't necessarily the most skilled player but I was very athletic and I was very determined and like so like no one conditioned better than me and I think that a lot of that comes from my dad like I'd be playing soccer and he'd like do his like little whistle he's like can whistle with his lips you know and if I wasn't playing hard he would just like go like this with his hand and I knew that I wasn't playing hard enough and um, I know that doesn't work with every kid but that's something that he didn't he didn't abuse that with me so like he kind of let me kind of set my pace, but if he felt it was like less than my best, he would let me know. And like, you know, he tried that same thing with my brother. It didn't work out the same way, but with me, for whatever reason, like I really responded well to that. And I think that experience with the soccer kind of being on the edge the whole time there too, yep. kind of informed a certain type of work ethic and a certain type of philosophy um, and kind of like never taking anything for granted, you know? And like, I eventually got cut from that team because I was playing, you know, football in high school and I was kind of having a hard time making practices and stuff. So getting cut from that team was a big deal. And then kind of I think never taking anything for granted you know like a lot of guys when I got to college like they were like oh we made it this is it but like you know I kind of knew that like I was I came in with three other tight ends and I had to prove that I was the best one of that uh, in college too so every every step of the way I kind of took it as like like a challenge a little bit you know and like um and I think that experience with the with the travel soccer really inform that yeah absolutely and I think that was a fantastic answer uh because like we were telling you before we started recording a lot of our premise on this podcast is based around people's journeys from where they started and making it to the the pinnacle of their sport and how they got there so I really liked hearing that that you know every step of the way whether it was soccer that you were playing or once you got to UCLA and you were playing football that you were still working to maintain that spot on the team uh, and that draws a pretty good parallel with hockey in the sense once you reach junior hockey college hockey pro hockey you have 25 30 guys on a roster and you can only put 20 guys on the ice for a given game so right. every week in practice you're competing against everybody everybody else on that roster to to get the the jersey in your locker stall on game day so i think yeah. that's a key thing you know to, to hear that 
even other sports, it's uh, the journey is still the same. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and like from what I don't know hockey super well, but even like at the NFL level, for example, like, you know, they, they, there's 53 guys on the active roster, but they only dress 46. So like every week you got to prove that you deserve to be a guy wearing a jersey on game day. You know what I mean? So like as a, as a rookie and as a second year guy, like when I wasn't playing, it's like I had to kind of carve out a role for myself. Like it was like punt return and like goal line tight end or whatever kick I was in the wedge like back when they did the wedge which was terrifying and terrible but like you know like it was it, it meant that I got a roster bonus that week you know what yeah. I mean and so like finding ways to like you know like uh, the, like the the kind of stereotypical example in hockey is the guy who wants to fight everybody yep. you know what I mean like just finding a way to show you have value and show yep. you deserve to be one of that select group I think is really important yeah, I mean, that's uh, when I was playing hockey, that it wouldn't be uncommon for us to have two to three, you know, drop the gloves, square up and fight, uh, you know, just go as in practice, just yeah. strictly because it's not nothing personal. You can still be best friends and teammates once you're done. But, you know, once we're on the ice and we're competing for that roster spot, it's either the scout's going to see me playing on the ice or the scout's going to see me up in the stands taking stats for, for the guys that are on the ice. So right. it's, what am I going to be? Uh, yeah. dog eat dog here so if you're competing with me I'm going to compete just as hard and you know if you want to fight me I'll fight back yeah and, and I think that's another thing like uh, I always you know like I think parents like being a parent myself you always wonder like how hard to push the kid you hear stories like yours your stories like mine you say I got to really push my kids to to achieve that level of greatness but I will say like I always had fun <laughs> like I, there was never a day that I was like man I really don't want to do this here. I really wish I was doing something else. Like, and my parents did a great job of fostering that in me and like kind of promoting that, that mentality. But that's something that I cared. Even like, even on my worst days in the NFL, like it was fun. Like, you know what I mean? Right. And like, and I think that's like, that is the, like the most important thing is that it's, it's fun because, because I'm having fun, I'm willing to invest more time into it. You know, I'm willing to get in the fight and practice. I'm willing to do that stuff because I'm having a good time with it and because it's important to me. So I think that's another thing that uh, is, is important to think about, you know. Yeah, and to, to you know, hammer home that point uh, with a quick story. Yeah, a couple, a couple months ago before we got shut down, I was on the ice yeah. doing resistance band training with um, a nine-year-old to work on his explosiveness a little bit with his stride. And at one point he was like, man, this isn't fun. But we were able to modify the drill a little bit, and he, he went home. He told his parents he had a great time at the session, and I was like, "Oh yeah, we did some resistance man training." I wasn't sure that he was going to, you know, come back with that report. And she's like, "Well, that's a key of you know why you guys are great coaches is because right. you then do stuff like the resistance man training, which is going to you know drive the athlete to that point where he doesn't like doing it, but he's still going to you're still going to modify it enough that you know he's still coming home saying he had fun and wants to go back." Yeah, and I think that's also like a really important thing to to note, like for coaches too. It's just like you know, every, like never take any type of, uh, like physical education for granted. Like in schools, we go, we go through this really like regimented and specific progressions. You know, we start like, you know, you learn your letters, you learn your numbers, and you learn how to like combine them into words and you learn how to combine them to add and subtract. Right. And it follows this very nice, clear progression. And I think with athletics, oftentimes that progression isn't as clear because like the maturity of the athlete, the physical capabilities of the athlete aren't necessarily correlated to their age. So oftentimes you have to like either regress an activity and like a great coach is someone who's able to identify when that regression is necessary and like when some type of modification is, is paramount, you know what I mean? And I think that right. um, that's so, so critical, especially with young kids, you know, like you can have them do something that's like too hard and not get anything out of it. Or you can be like, Hey, like I can put my ego aside and we can change this up and like make you enjoy it. And right. So. Right. There's always multiple ways to teach something and, kids are going to learn in different ways. So because it's, it works for Johnny doesn't mean it's going to work for Billy and vice versa. That's right. yeah. So you do have to kind of adapt on the fly there. Uh, but kind of going back and we're kind of jumping down a rabbit hole here, so I apologize. But um, you were talking a little bit about, you know, an athlete's progression. So USA Hockey, the governing body for that oversees all of hockey within the United States, they came out with a study. This was a couple of years ago, but I don't remember the exact ages. So, you know, for uh, right. the sake of the story here, just kind of bear with me. But they said, like, between the ages of 10 or 8 and 10, you're more like, – 
kids at the age where they're more likely to pick up on hand-eye coordination skills, sure. stick handling, stuff like that. And they kind of did build us a little bit of that roadmap, like you were talking about with, you know, learning your numbers, spelling, et cetera, um, as to how to develop an athlete based on their ages. Is there a governing body for football that uh, oversees everything? And is there any similar studies that show uh, like the same correlations in how athletes develop? That you So, yeah, yeah. So nothing specifically for football. Like, uh, I think the, I think, you know, like football is kind of steeped in a tradition that is not anti-science, but it doesn't embrace science in the same way, you know, especially at the youth levels. I mean, in the NFL, they're trying to, to get there with some of like the, uh, the data monitoring and the GPS stuff and like the load management stuff, which is like all kind of heady. And there's a ton of research on that. But like, if you look at just general um, athletic development research and different models that have come up, like, yeah, I think there's a ton of really cool stuff out there. And the one thing that I would advise is like for parents, you know, like specifically is everyone gets caught up in this idea. Like, Oh, my kid is 11. He should be doing this. But remember, like, everyone hits puberty and develops at a different time and a different rate. Right. Chris so your kid, for it. What, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> I a beard on my face coming out of the room, but, you know, I mean, don't wait to get taller. Yeah. It'll come, man. Don't worry. You know what? At 33, yeah, it's real right near puberty time. Like I, 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 look, I look at my brother-in-law, for example, dude's uh he's like a green beret now he's like totally alpha man like he's six two he's um you know 100, 215 pounds and he's like jacked right and when he was in high school um he did he was like five seven until he was a senior in high school wow. and so like so like i bring that story up because like his athletic his physical maturity did not match his age right and i think that's really important like when people throw these age numbers out there that's an average right it's exactly. average eight yep. to ten right but let's say like your kid's like really tall and gangly and they're about to hit like a fill out growth spurt but they're 11 like i hate to break it to you their hand eye is not going to be great until they get that muscle mass to support that frame right so just so just kind of keep that stuff in mind everyone's a little different and like there's like, I mean, there's, everyone has stories. Like there was a guy that I played with in middle school who was like the biggest, baddest dude on the block, right? He was five, five and he was, you know, 180 pounds of like, you know, like steel. And then he didn't grow for the rest of his life. You know what I mean? And so like, he was way ahead of everybody else. But I think, I think though that, that maturity element, uh, that physical maturation element is so critical for that early development stuff, right? Because there are guidelines, but if your kid isn't where, there's where the guideline is indicates they should be. That's okay too. You know what I mean? I think that's right. why I bring that up. Yeah. It's so. funny. You know, all of the, the, all the years that I've coached and the different ages that I've coached and seen um, a lot of the kids that are good, really, really good at a young age are, are not very good or they're, they've been caught up to. Right. Right. At that older age. So right. to kind of the late bloomers, almost it's better to be a late bloomer, I think, in my eyes, because more of the like even looking at Alex Lamoth, right, like mm-hmm. great hockey player. He's going into his senior year at Penn State. Um, he didn't start skating until he was like eight or nine. You know? Yeah. So for like nowadays, that's that's like unheard yeah, of. Right. People late. started like four or five. They, that's very late. So well, dude, like you bring up a... got into it late and then like just sort of took off. You bring up a fantastic point. Like in talk, talking about these youth development models, like the kids that do that are the most diversified in their sporting background early yep. tend to be the most athletic. Now, is that a causation or correlation? It's really hard to say. But um, if you look at like, you know, like a kid who plays soccer, basketball, baseball, and they run track, right? They are developing different movement patterns and a different physical kind of vernacular than other kids would, you know what I mean? Who just play football, right? If you just play football, very linear, very specific patterns, very specific movements, and then they lose kind of the dexterity of the footwork with the soccer, or they lose the hand-eye with the basketball and the jumping and the, all those different elements, so I do think that like parents want to specify they're in like an arms race with all these other parents. And they say, Oh my, I, I do the same thing with my kids. <laughs> six, right. I do the same thing. Right. Like I'm like, Oh, that kid's way better than Owen. Like maybe I need to get him, you know, in some more hockey classes or in some more baseball classes. But then I gotta kind of got to slow myself down and be like, you know what? I'm not in it for right now. I want him to have fun now. I want him to enjoy sport, but I want 
that development when he kind of reaches a physical maturity, like eight to or 10 to 13, when that starts to happen, then we can start looking into more specificity. And I think people often forget about that, right? They just are like, it totally goes over their heads. They're so dialed into making their kid the best at seven that they get either a burned out or like they they reach this tremendous uh, you know technical acumen with the sport, but they never develop physically because they didn't have this wide base of other athletic patterns to support what they're doing. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does a lot. I mean, I think uh, you know USA Hockey's done a much better job in the last maybe four or five years to really point out that you know, hey, multi-sport athletes are more often than not, they're the ones that go further than anybody else. You know, so right. Quite too much too early. Right. And you see a lot of these like injuries that, you know, professional athletes get kids are getting them. Right. Because yeah. you have so many reps in, in one sort of linear, uh, lineal, like, you know, training set. Yeah, man. Well, I'm going to take my two year old in for Tommy John just to get it out of the way now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but I think that's a, that's a really good point. Like, a lot of the injury prevention stuff comes from diversifying pattern. Like if you look at the research, like one of the biggest causes of injury is too much volume in a specific plane, right? That's one of the reasons why you see like bench people who bench press a lot with like elbow tendinopathy. Like it's not because the weight or anything like that. It's because it's the specific pattern over and over and over and over again. Right. And so the idea that, um, you know, you need to kind of move in different planes and do different things. Like an easy way to get that done is just to kind of play different sports and do different activities. Right. Like that's one thing my dad, like, you know, bless him. He doesn't know a lot about like physical training and physical preparedness, but he was like, Logan, you are going to play a different sport every season throughout your whole career. So I played three sports in high school. I played three sports in middle school. I played four, actually played four sports in high school because I had to play soccer too, in addition to my three sport. You know what I mean? So that was his one rule for me. And I think it served me really well, you know what I mean? In terms of developing me athletically. Yeah. I wish my parents would have made me do that. When I, was, when, I, when I was that age, when I was like middle school, high school, like I, pl- I always played basketball with my buddies, we, yeah. we threw the football around and I played football, but I never like hockey is really the only organized sport that I ever right. And because like my dad was gone a lot overseas for work. My mom worked full time. Right. So they're like, you can pick a sport, right? But they were, yeah. like, you know, like baseball to me was I'm sure this will irritate some people, <laughs> but like I hated baseball to play it. Like it was so slow. I hated standing there yeah. in the middle of the field, like being bored. So, yeah. I mean, hockey was like the only thing that was fun for me, but I, yeah. I wish that that's probably the one thing I wish they would have done differently. was like, Hey, you know, go play basketball. Like you have to go play basketball or you have to yeah. play soccer. Or, well, I, I think that's, you bring up a really great point. If you look at the research that, that you going and playing basketball with your buddies is just as valuable as being in an organized setting, right? Like just because you're out there, you're kind of setting the rules, you're, you're playing with your buddies, you're moving in different ways, you're moving in ways that you did like that you designate. And I think if you look at the research, there's very little uh, difference between a kid who plays, you know, hockey competitively year round, but inter inter intermixes like basketball or baseball in their own time, right? And a person who plays three different sports. It's just about kind of getting that different positions and planes and velocities um, throughout the year. For sure. Well, I think in training too, like just overall agility. I know in just a background for, for everybody that, that tunes into this, right? Um, Logan is developing like a resistance training tool um, off the ice. And so he and I have, have used it a lot. And he and I have talked a lot about, you know, specific hockey movements. We've also done a lot of things that, that I wouldn't do if I was skating, right? Like right. movements, um, more stuff you do in a track setting or right. things like that. They're way outside my comfort zone because I never <laughs> ran track. So he, he ends up laughing at me a lot the first couple of times I do it. But then I, but then I get it. So then I get like, uh, attaboy. <laughs> Atta boy. Atta boy. There's my guy. <laughs> so, uh, but but yeah, can, like you, that, can you give us like a little? Can you talk a little bit about um, about that style of training? Because I think it's something that a lot of people have done. Maybe some resistance stuff before, but 
Right. Give us sort of a, a background on like how, you know, what your philosophy is and sort of how you're developing for youth. And I mean, this is stuff that D1 guys can do. This is stuff that professionals can do. I mean, and you use this, right? Give us kind yeah. of a talk yeah. a little bit about how you use it too in your workouts. Yeah. So I, I've been kind of thinking about the best way to explain it. And basically like, um, I think we as a society have fallen into this like very specific idea of what strength and conditioning is, right? You load a barbell, you run linearly, you don't do a lot of variation because those, um, those things are really easy to time and they're really easy to measure, right? But like in terms of transferring that, like you're building horsepower with those activities and that's really important, right? But in terms of transferring that to sport, like I personally am of the belief that most athletes – like obviously the Julio Jones and the Trent Williams of the world, you know, they can do back squat and then go out and play great football. Right. But for the guys who are lesser athletes than that, they need some type of transition. Right. And, um, you know, I had the, like this, this privilege, the great privilege of working with a guy named Brad DeWeese, who's regarded as the best sprint coach in the United States, which is really cool. Um, and his thing is like surfing this, surfing the force velocity curve and, that's what this tool, in my opinion, allows you to do. It allows you to work different positions, different velocities, and different points of tension, right? So, like, in terms of intermuscular tension, I know I'm getting a little in the weeds here, so I'll just try to stick with it. Intermuscular tension is the idea that, um, like, that's where you're getting strong. The more tension you have on your muscle, that's sh- developing strength. And the less tension you have, the faster the muscle can move, right? And so taking these moments of really high tension – in kind of athletic positions and then slowly transitioning them to fast to, to speed, right. Where there's no tension on the muscle really, I think is something that is really underdeveloped. And I think that that is really important. And then also talking about what I do with Chris is just getting your body in different positions, different balance points and kind of building that base out so that you kind of limit your exposure to injury and allow yourself to do a little bit of prehab work, right? So like messing with different velocities and messing with different positions under a moderate load. You know, nothing we do, Chris, is too heavy, right? It's just uh, kind of, like I mean, yeah, resistance. you might say, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but I think that's that's kind of what, what I, when I, when I started working on this and I, when I started working with Chris on this, like that's what I fell in love with about it is like, you can mess with different velocities. You can definitely mess with different loads and mess with different positions under load and different velocities, which is something that you can't get in a conventional weight room setting, I guess. Yeah. I think, um, and you said this a while ago, but like your kinesthetic awareness, yes. awareness yeah. of where your body is yeah, it just like in any plane. Right? Yeah. Like how, no, how you're moving. I think that's a really for any high level athlete or any anyone that wants to pursue just just to better yourself, right? I mean just to be know where you are in space. I think that's a hundred percent right. And like that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about like weight like traditional strength conditioning is very in a box. Yes. And we don't we don't work these other positions, right, which cultivate athleticism, right? And especially for kids who, you know, can't do multiple sports, can't diversify their movement patterns, this is a way to get that, get some general strength work, which is really important. It's like one of the most important variables in, in, uh, in improving acceleration and speed mechanics and stuff like that. But it also allows them to load these other um, – less uh less studied positions you know which i think is really important and i've found like i think i've told you chris since i've started doing this this program like all of like my knee pain and my hip pain and my back pain has gone away and i don't think that's because of the program i think it's just because i'm moving in different ways than i am traditionally accustomed with a little bit of load and i think that's been super beneficial yeah i think you you hit a lot of those stabilizing muscles i know i noticed on a lot of the lower body stuff that we do where, you know, where I'm working on getting, uh, like my, uh, my knees to rotate out. Yes. Right. Picking up my heel, almost like kind of behind you. So sort of bring yeah. like to your hip levels. Just yeah. you don't do that ever in hockey. Everything yeah. is like really inside out. Right. You're really tight. And then you're extending right back to right back to center. Yeah. And I, and I think it's interesting. Like when you do it, like you look, like a hockey player, right? You have a very specific <laughs> movement pattern, right? Your elbows come forward, your hands come forward, right? You're, you are very kind of 
in the same plane, like you're very strong in a specific specific position. Specific, yes. there, whoa, and um, <laughs> and I think that that is that's that's you are the case study for what a uh, sports specificity is. You know what I mean? And I am too with football. Like I was very a certain way until I started doing this other stuff. And I think those elements of like the stabilizers, the kinesthetic awareness, the loads and strengthening those positions under a load. Cause like they say, that's one of the best ways to reinforce a novel position or a new position is just to put a little bit of load on it because your body doesn't have to recruit any muscle fibers. If like, let's say I'm trying to get into a full squat, right? I just sit there. There's no load under me. Like I'm using very little of my muscle fiber to do that. Right. Very little of my, my body is very calm but the second i load it my body has to organize itself to support this load in the most effective way and so that's what and that's another thing this gets you right so like traditionally if you do the hurdle step over like i do with you chris without load it's really hard to reinforce that position if that makes sense yeah so I'm a, I'm a lot more dense uh, on all this <laughs> physical training stuff than, than both you guys uh so just to see you if I understand this correctly, but you guys are talking about uh, it works a lot of the stabilizing muscles and uh, stuff like that. But does that also help a lot with the injury prevention? One of the things, uh, like I was telling you, if I had six <laughs> surgeries for back and they always tell me that a lot of times when my back will go into spasm, it's strictly just because my body's guarding itself from something uh, it doesn't want me to do. So by enhancing these or working these stabilizing muscles, is that going to help, you know, stuff like that where with injury prevention or people that have those pre-existing conditions to build the strength that they need to hopefully mitigate their, their pain from it? I worked out a couple of my buddies on it with like back pains and hip pains and torn adductors and torn hip, uh, torn rotator cuffs in the hip and torn, torn labrums in the hip, excuse me. And one of the things that I've found is like traditional rehab, like you get on all fours and you scale up, right? Mm-hmm. And your body doesn't know how to organize itself in the way that you would normally be, which is like bipedal standing upright. So like the way this works is it kind of forces you to use your body in the way you're supposed to be used. Right. And meaning that like one of the, one of the things I see commonly with people with back pain is that their glutes aren't supporting their spine. Right. So like the mid, like you have this thing in your back called your QL, your quadratus lumborum. And that is like kind of your like jack of all trades, master of none in the back, right? And that thing is not supposed to take a ton of load. If it needs to, it will. But oftentimes, like that's what's stabilizing your spine. And that's not supposed to be a main spine stabilizer. Right. Your glute is supposed to help with that, right? And so this basically kind of demands through just like repetitive motion in different positions that you engage your glutes, you engage your core, you engage your obliques in a very specific way that's specific to us being bipedal and standing upright. You know what I mean? And I think that um, that's one of the reasons I, I, I don't know for sure. I'm not a physical therapist, but in talking with physical therapists, it kind of, I think that's one of the reasons my back pain's gone away is because my glutes have kind of taken over the role that they're supposed to have. My QL is supposed to be, my erectors are supposed to be, my lats are supposed to be in the right position. And I think it's kind of helped me organize a little bit more effectively. Well, that's a very interesting take on it too, because a lot of times you just hear, uh, okay, you're, you have back pain, you need to strengthen your core to, right. uh, to alleviate and take the stress off your lower back. And uh, so, so it's, it's really interesting to hear that actually, you know, you know, I'm sure it helps, but also you need to fire those glutes as well. Well, I think interestingly, like I've talked to a whole bunch of physical, th- like, that's one of the things about the NFL. My experience in the NFL was great is you get to talk to some of the best physical therapists in the world. And anybody who's worth their salt will say like a co- the core, the term core is a total misnomer, right? right. And what they, what they mean by that is like your core starts at the top of your knee yeah. and goes basically to your shoulder girdle, yeah. right? Yeah. So like if my quads and my hamstrings and my glutes and my adductors aren't, and my hip flexors and my psoas aren't working, then all of that, the stability that comes from those muscle groups is transferred to my back and my core, right? And my rectus okay. abdominis. And if my rectus abdominis are too tight, I'm going to put a lot of load on my back, right? So finding a way to balance that out, especially in a, in a society that's like predominantly sedentary, I think is really challenging. And I think this thing allows 
you know, like we're still working on it a little bit. I think it allows people to do that, you know. And Grady, I'd love to get you on it, get your thoughts on it. Yeah, you point. actually you had me sold on it. I, I don't know when the last time I worked out was. I don't think it was, I don't know if it was. A, I can tell you it wasn't any time this decade. I don't know if it was in the last one, but uh, I, you had me sold on it. I'd love to give it a try. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, just kind of doesn't need to be anything crazy, but like that's one thing that I like about it too is. I have like a high intensity day where I sprint, I throw, I jump and I like squat essentially with the machine. And then I have a low intensity day, which is all prehab work. And one of the things that I've loved about it is like all of those like kind of BS, like ankle, knee, hip, back, shoulder stuff that I had before has gone away. And I wish I could give you a specific reason as to why, but right. that's outside of my depth a little bit. You know? <laughs> Uh, but obviously there's something to it. Uh, so you, you're developing this tool. Are you doing anything as far as personal training, athletic training, stuff like that? Yeah. You know, like before this all went down, like I was training, um, training uh, probably a handful of people, five, seven people, something like that, you know, kind of, and that's the great thing about the tool is I can take it to your house and, you know, like in a lot of people, like, and especially now or not now, but before we're so busy, that was a really big uh, selling point with it. Um, but yeah, so that's what I'm doing now. I work with kids. I work with adults. Like I'm just about trying to help people out any way that I can. So awesome. Sort of the thing I like about the tool that, that you're, that you've designed and uh -huh. that you're working on and with is uh, you can't cheat in these. Yeah. Positions. It's like if I have a, if I don't have a good squat position, I can still squat but yeah. it might, might look like crap <laughs> look at your desk, right and i might be doing damage to myself or like the, the way that this resistance training is and and where it sets up on your trunk right like yeah right your waist i guess you're yeah. not, what they, you would call your natural waist yeah um, you can't like if you're standing too tall you can't move even right. with a little bit of resistance no yeah so i think and really that's one thing you, yeah, I think that's a great point. And thanks for bringing it up. It's just that like you are you're you're moving in space in a way that you can't under a load that you can't move in the weight room. And for most kids especially, that is so important. You know, everyone wants to get them under a barbell or like with dumbbells in their hands, but like they need just su just a touch of strength and conditioning, like a touch of uh, an element of strength. And so why not combine that with another modality, right? Just a different position, maybe a more sports specific position and just kind of build that general kinesthetic awareness like we were talking about, you know? Well, and a lot of, right. I mean, a lot of the players that we see are younger. I mean, most of the kids are going to be 14 or younger, right? That's sort yeah. of the target is you have a lot of kids at that age. And then as you, you know, at least at a higher level, right? And as you know, playing, you know, being a professional athlete, um, the number of people that keep going just dwindles down. But smaller, yeah. smaller and smaller. So I think you at those ages, 14 and, and under, I don't even think I was in a weight room working out with actual weights until I was like 15 or 16. Yeah, and I think the important thing is, like, that is something that becomes really important for that second tier. Like, the second you go to college, like, you're expected to know how to, like, back squat. You're expected to know how to bench press and power clean, all these things. And I think a lot of people rush kids into that, that stimulus too soon. Like, I think they need some general, some general strength first while working on the positions of those movements, right? Yeah. And, um, and that's another thing I love about this is that it's extremely scalable, right? So like I will be in a workout and my three-year-old daughter will come out and say she'll want to do a couple reps so I can move the load from whatever I'm doing. I'm like I said, I'm six, four, I'm 265 pounds. My daughter's, you know, two and a half feet tall and she weighs 40 pounds and she can get whatever she wants to get done on there. You know what I mean? And not, I'm not worried about her hurting herself. I'm not worried about anything. Right. So I think that that's another element that's really important. It's like, you can scale it. You can keep the athletes safe. You can get them some of this strength work while not exposing them to an undue amount of risk, I would say. It also makes it sound like it just teaches you a lot more about how your body works as a whole, uh, how yeah. you move and proper ways to make those motions. 
Yeah, I think that's one hundred percent right. And I think like like Chris, like that's something that Chris really. Like I think about it from uh, from like a velocity and strength perspective more. And it's been cool to have Chris involved because he thinks about it from like I don't move this way that often, and like right. that is so important. Also, you know what I mean? Is building that foundation of movement so that the peak can be much higher, right? Like right. I, like when I like when I do sprint work, like I know how my knee should track, I know how my hip should feel. But a lot of people don't even know that. So like getting them in these situations before that high intensity activity, I think is really important also. Yeah, and having that added knowledge on how your body works and how your body's movements work, uh, it's going to just be that much more beneficial to you once you do get in a gym under a barbell or you do make it to that college and you're expected to know how to power clean. I right. think it just sets you up that much more to be able to execute techniques properly once you understand how your body actually works and how it moves. <laughs> Right. And like the other thing that I've always said is like with a kid, like you need very little general strength work, you know, like push a sled, pull a sled, do something like that. That's not going to like crush your back, but it's teaching you how to brace, get your legs stronger, increase general mechanism strength, get a broom handle or a PVC pipe and work those other positions, right? The squat, the hinge, the like the RDL or the deadlift, the yep. bench press, the bent over row. Because then you're learning your like that that element, right? And so at some point, when it's time to load, you know, oh, this is the correct position. And I think that is that's something that is often overlooked and rushed way too quickly. And like kind of like you both have been saying, so well, yeah, I hate to admit it, but as a coach, I honestly have never thought of that myself. Getting kids ready to actually work out properly, yeah. as, as, as opposed to just throwing them into the gym and saying work out. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, that's something that I had to learn. Like I learned, like, you know, I, I was, I had my, my high school weightlifting experience was probably like 90 or hundred percent of the people listening. Like the coach was like, put that bar on, put the weight on the bar and lift it. And you were like, okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's, and, that's still, that's my knowledge on working out. Well, we're, all, we're all about to say, I think we're all pretty much the same age. So, you know, 20 years ago when we were starting to work out, like that was kind of normal. I mean, you yeah. just sort of watch people do it. And I think that the knowledge base, like part of it's your coach's knowledge and their, and how they communicate it to you. I think that the best thing that, that Logan, that you bring to the table, like for when we're doing stuff outside, you give like a, like, here's what your body's doing when you're doing it. Right. And, and here's why, you know, okay. When you're, you're picking your leg up back here like your glute is super weak on your left side yeah right like, so you you don't like you bring your foot down too too fast yeah right well th leg. thank you chris that's a nice compliment coming from you because i think you're a fantastic coach hey thanks so i appreciate it <laughs> i paid him uh slip you 20 bucks <laughs> uh well yeah, i mean I, that, I, I, but it's huge right i mean i think the more you know the more knowledge that you have like especially just training in general right you really have to know um what your what your body has to do the, the necessary steps to take and, and, your body through what you're doing like we're on the ice i'm i'm telling these guys like okay well you gotta you gotta do these five things that, but then you have to make it look like it's all one seamless thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just do it. Like open That's your right. blade, close your blade, pull it across your body, like push your hands away from your body, cross over. I mean, like yeah. all these things and then, okay, just go and do it. <laughs> yeah I, and I think like that's like that's such an interesting point because in sport you think about that all the time like I used to be such a technique freak even in the NFL like my foot's got to be here my hands got to be here my hat's got to be here my pad's got to be here and but people don't think of that in the weight room and I think it's almost it's not as important but it is important to think of it that way and I look at you know all these people like like kids especially and that's one reason I like working with kids is you help set them up for a lifetime of safe and informed and productive strength training right because uh, you might not be able to play hockey forever but you can like my dad still works out you know what i mean he'll go out and lift up his dumbbells in the backyard and he still does it like he did it when he was 20 you know what i mean and it's terrible for him but like if you can get him if you can get him doing it right when he's young right then like they have that it's like golf in my opinion yep. you know but it's something that's going to be a little bit more productive and as long as you know how to scale and and be responsible with your weight choices i think that's so important and that's one thing that i get really fired up when i deal with a kid like even when i got to work with your kids chris like just like giving them little nuggets like if they take one thing away from a session like that's so important because it's something that they can use forever if, if they if they take it the right way 
Well, yeah, I'm looking at my, well, for one, they're my kids, so they never listen. <laughs> <laughs> but looking at, at my kids, um, they're, they're good at different things. They're really different. Right, yes. So, well, you know, one will be like, okay, pretty good, like uh, explosive speed. But yeah. then form-wise, the older one's better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, so it's just – it's funny how how different they are, but interesting that, you know, they take little things here and there. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. And, like, I think that's the other cool thing, and you guys probably know about this more than me, is, like, every time you coach a new person, like, you – you improve, right? Because you learn how to communicate a little bit better with somebody different, right? Like the way I said that didn't make sense to you. Like, how does it make sense <laughs> for you? You know what I mean? And like right. finding ways to get that communication is so critical, I think. Yeah. I mean, you do have kids that are visual learners, some that are auditory right. learners. So you do have to find ways to get the same message across to both. And I mean, that's really the staple of being a good coach is can you relay your communication to both you know different kids and have them pick up the same points yeah and like my wife was a teacher for a long time uh, before we moved out here and she always says to me like never take anything for granted like never assume that they have like this foundational piece understood right yep. like you, if you got to go back and make sure that they understand like 10 steps before like sometimes that's what you got to do and because like if if a, if a house is built on a foundation of sand, it's not going to stand, right? So finding those that weak link in their in their learning, I think, is also important. Yeah, I think with older players too, right? They that have bad habits, you really got to take it back to right. And a lot of yeah. some kids are, you know, they're like, well, like this is super basic stuff. But if you look at, I think any, you know, really almost at any level, like it, everybody works on the basics. Start yeah. the basics that's how you warm up or that's you know that's really when you're in a game full speed you don't want to be doing like 10 different crazy things on the ice no yeah no you're gonna do whatever is simple and effective like one move you know it's quick deception yeah no i think that's 100 percent right like like even the warm-ups in the nfl you know a lot of them are based around like helping people maintain running mechanics. It's not at full speed, but there are drills. There's like, yeah. and that's something that you think everyone would have in the bag, but no. Yeah, even especially at that level, right? I mean, yeah. these guys are getting paid a ton of money to play a sport professionally. And you're like, yeah. oh, those guys don't do the basics. But I mean, we look, we've got buddies that yeah. play pro hockey. Uh, in yeah, Europe. I was just going to bring that up. Adam, yeah. uh, Adam Comrie, who is a guest uh, on this podcast twice, we did two different parts with him about his pro career and all of that, but he comes out and trains with us and he wants to work on the basic fundamentals, the right. stuff that we even yeah, have eight year old kids stuff. doing that are still learning how to skate. And he says that it's, at the pro level, it's still just as necessary to maintain those fundamentals of the very beginner uh, tactics. So then that way you still have that fundamental base and you can continue to build off of it. So in your career as a professional athlete, could you attest to that as well? Would you find yourself still working on some of the most basic things, even at the, the top of uh, you know playing in the NFL? Yeah, hundred percent. Like I used to, so like there was a guy that I played with in college and I'd say, I told this to my wife and he was, he was a freak. He was like six, I want to say six, six. He was like two eighty. played tight end. He could run. He ran like a four, six, but you never, you, you've never heard of him because he couldn't take uh, a six inch step with his right foot. Right. And like, so that was something after seeing that I was like, this is, that's why it's important. So every day before practice, I would go out and I'd work my footwork and I, you know, no one sees that no one, like you don't get any points for that, but I work it before and I'd work it after. And it's like, cause I knew that if I couldn't get my first and second step down before the defense event hit me, like I'd have no power and it would be a soft edge for the running back. Right. Right. So like just making sure those and then like hand placement, pat, like those things are things they talk about like day one of any football activity, Pop Warner, middle school football, high school. Right. But like at the NFL, like you'll see dudes like J Jake Matthews is a great example. He'd be out there working his pass set for like 15 minutes before practice even started. And you think he has done that probably a million times in his life. I'm not exaggerating. He yep. played tackle at Pop Warner played tackle in high school he played tackle in college he's played tackle in the nfl he knows how to pass that especially on the left side like that's what he does 
but he'd get out there early, work his hands. He'd get a defensive player. They'd work a little bit, you know, and to see that type of fundamentals by a guy that's a really good football player, I think. Is, and even Julio, Julio Jones gets out there early, works like route breaks, you know, how many route breaks has he done in his entire life? Yeah, more right. than more than any other person on that team, probably. <clears throat> so I think that's something that um, that like kids hate it, but like it is so important. Like even like with with like young kids, when I'm like, hey, like approach the barbell the same way every time. Like that's one of those fundamental things, right? Because if you're in a different spot on the barbell, your hands are different, your feet are different. Like, how does your body know what to do? You know what I mean? Right. So like. Yeah, sorry, I rambled a little bit there. No, one of the key things that I think you hit on there was when you said you were out there, you're doing it, but it doesn't get you any points. Uh, yeah. You're right, it doesn't get you any points, but think about it, it can also lose you points in the eyes of the coaches. Yeah. You're yeah, not out there yeah. doing that stuff, and yeah. like you said, you weren't planning that foot, and you uh, had a soft edge for the ru- uh, running back. Yeah. Uh, think about it, you do that two to three times in a game, right? And yeah, absolutely. That's major deducted points. So you'd be riding the pine. Yeah, riding the pine. It doesn't help you in the immediate future by putting that work in. It does help your game, and it helps you mean stay on the field, so you're not making those costly mistakes. Well, and also, like I always, you know, I said, like I was never the best athlete at the NFL level, and one of the things that repetition does is it makes it intuitive or like reactive, yep. as opposed to something you got to think about. Because the person who has to think about something does it slower than the person who just does it, right? And the only way I know how to do it is just to drill it until my body just defaults to that position, yep. right? And like, so I might like you, like I always equate it to boxing. Like run blocking is very similar in terms of timing. Um, like you don't understand the distance until you've done it you know, 4,000 times, you know what I mean? Like, right. and I think that that's something that like, I try to talk, I try to talk to young people in the NFL, young tight ends and be like, you got to work this because you don't see the distance correctly. Right. You don't know where your feet should be. You don't know where your hands should be. And they kind of brush you off, but they never become proficient in the run game because they don't attack that fundamental element of their game. Makes a lot of sense. You got anything else for Logan? No, I think, I mean, we we'll probably talk for like another five hours. I know. It's just fascinating. Shoot the breeze. Logan, last right. question for you. Redskins are in major need of a tight end. You coming back? Oh, my gosh. If they call <laughs> me, I'd probably, I'd probably give it a good look because it's like right down the street here from where I live. But uh, I don't know. I'm, 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 if, it, if it's good, like if, I, if I'm going to if I'm gonna make a team, I would think about it. But if I'm just going to go to camp, they can keep it because like you go to camp. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. You're not 15 anymore. You don't need to go yeah. to away camp. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I mean? Like, you go to camp, like, to get the shit beat out of you. For You don't get paid for that, by the way. You don't just wait. go and you just do that for free. And it's like, yeah, I just took like a year off my life for no. <laughs> <laughs> so. well, there you go. You heard it on our podcast. <laughs> you call us in back with the Washington Redskins. <laughs> <laughs> We'll make, we'll make a phone call later. Yeah, yeah, right? Because I'm sure we know somebody. Can. Yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> but, uh, well, dude. In, in all seriousness, thank you so much for your time today. You were a fantastic guest, a wealth of information, uh, and I can't wait to try that resistance training out with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. It'll be great. And thanks for having me on, guys. It was super fun, and hopefully we'll be hanging out more and doing some training together. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, in person. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> all right, man. It's good, uh, good talking to you. Thanks for being on. Yeah, no problem, bud. Hopefully it was all right. Hopefully I didn't talk too much. No, I killed it, man. Yeah, you didn't talk too much.